Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to, to worship this morning. Let me get my card. Welcome to worship this morning, and um, for those of you watching online, uh, welcome as well. And we're glad to have um, uh, Sue Black with us this morning. She'll be giving us uh, the message and leading us in worship this, this morning. Um, there's announcements in the in the bulletin. Uh, I think it's a pretty pretty quiet week, but uh, what we need to know for the coming week is is in the bulletin. Please uh, feel free to read uh, read through them and uh, know what you need to be doing this week if you have meetings coming up. Um, I wanted to start off uh, and as a minute for mission. I actually have two uh, two ways to go this morning. The first one is I'm wearing my a uh, hat first for um, the city rescue mission. Um, I'm on the board at the at the city rescue mission, have been for for many years, and we have uh, some other board members. Ryan's on the board, and um, uh, Dan Vogler's on the board from this church, and Randy works over at the at at the mission and development. So uh, we're well represented in this in this church uh, over at the city rescue mission, and. Um, there's a couple opportunities coming up uh, this week to learn some more about the mission. Uh, we used to have uh, an, an open house every year where you could come in and take tours of the different facilities, the Sankey Center over to Hope Place, the Women's Shelter, and see the, see the mission um, right downtown there, take tours. Um, and uh, post, that was all pre-COVID, and so we took a couple years off um, because of because of COVID, and now that things are back up and running, we sort of reimagined. We have a new leader over there, Kevin Green, retired a couple of years ago. Uh, so Mr. Jack Lynn is is now the CEO over at the mission, and um, so we're reimagining how we're how we're doing things. And so we are having a a virtual open house uh, this coming Thursday. I have some information for for those of you who may be interested. Um, at 8 o'clock on this Thursday evening, uh, online, there's a, there's a video. It's about 25 minutes, half hour, so it's a, it's a short view. Um, and it goes over everything that we do at the mission. Um, and it's, it's really neat. I've, I've got a chance to, to, to preview it. We hired a company out of Pittsburgh to film it. There's some drones in there flying around the mission and, and different people that you're talking to. You may even see me on the video, maybe. Um, so if you, if you have a chance, please, please watch that. It's online. I have, like I said, I have information. It's 8 o'clock on Thursday night. Or you could go to the, to the mission's website. I believe it's cityrescuemission.org. And the link should be right down there to, 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 to view that, um, that video. And then in addition to that, next Sunday, um, there's sort of a mini open house. It's not exactly like it used to be. But they're having brunch from 11 to 3. Um, so if, if you get a chance to watch a video and you want to come over and talk to Jack, some of the board members will be there. Um, there'll be some food to eat, and you, you could probably tour. I'm not 100% sure exactly how to work, but you could probably get a little tour of the, the actual mission there. We're not going out to Sankey Center or Harbor House, but um, if you're interested, come over between 11 and 3 next week as well and see the, see the mission um, and what's going on there. It's, it's a wonderful organization. Uh, been there. I think this is our hundred and hundred and eleventh, hundred and twelfth year. Um, so please take take some time to to learn some more about it um, and come and see us. And that leads to, to 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 the next point. I also have the the stewardship minute this morning. We're in October, so we're thinking about our our budgets for next year and and thinking about the the the, the mission. And I wanted to, to tie it into to how we're doing stewardship here and. And our stewardship committee had some different um, themes and ideas um, to promote stewardship through the month of October. And one of the one of the themes we kicked around was stewardship, past, present, future. Um, and the city rescue mission, we're thinking about the past. The city rescue mission had roots here at this church. And I wanted to bring a picture in of some of the people that were involved. It was hanging in the library. Christina can attest. I didn't do a very good job getting it off the wall, so. I apologize, I owe somebody hanging pictures back. Um, of some of the folks who may have been involved at that back, and you've probably seen the pictures, they were up in the Heritage Center of, of the folks from back at, at the turn of the century uh, who were at this church. Um, 
and they were involved in getting the, the city rescue mission started. Um, and it wasn't always easy. You know, they had bumps in the road, I'm sure, um, with, with money, with resources, with people. And then not much has changed today. You know, it's still a challenge for that. Um, but they persevered, they prayed and worked, and here we are 110, 112 years later, um, still serving the people of Newcastle. And so you have, you have quotes, tying this in as well, whoops. You have little quotes on your, uh, on your table. Every week we're trying to do a quote to inspire you during stewardship. And this week is, um, don't let what you cannot do interfere with what you can do. And so thinking back to the, to the city rescue mission, those folks had lots of challenges, but they knew what they could do. You know, they're not going to solve homelessness. They're not going to solve hunger. They're not going to solve addiction. Um, those are some pretty big problems that I, I don't think that, that we can solve here in, in Newcastle. And a lot, of, a lot of people, you know, have to work together to try and solve, but it's always going to be a problem. But you can do other things. And tying that back to, to what we're doing here, um, you know, at the church, um, we're thinking about stewardship. And what does that mean? Um, in terms of what we can do. Now, I don't think a lot of us, unless you win the billion dollar jackpot in, uh, it, it, for Powerball, you're not gonna be able to write us a check to fix the roof or fix the organ or, or pay for a, a, a mission trip for the church to go on. Um, but don't let that discourage you. Um, you know, there's lots of things that you, that you can do. Um, it doesn't have to be a huge gift. And every single dollar counts. I mean, I'm sure everybody knows that. If you uh, you know, a tithe is a biblical, you know, way to go. Um, but if even if you can't tithe, think of every dollar that you bring in and all your other talents as well. You know, it might be um, it might it might be mentoring youth, serving on a committee, visiting our homebound members. There's lots of things that we can do here at this church to keep things moving along in 2024 uh, and beyond. So. Again, think about the folks who back a hundred and some years ago started the mission at this church and they can inspire us. quotes. There's going to be a different one every week on there. And again, don't let what you cannot do interfere with what you can do. So thank you for your time. Remember, please come see the mission this week. And I have, again, information on that and anything else on stewardship. Our finance committee is Lori Seminero, Wendy, myself, Pastor Lori. We'd be glad to talk to you. Thank you. join me in prayer. 
In the midst of our failures, we stand in God's grace. In the midst of our struggle, we boast in our hope through Jesus Christ. In the midst of our sufferings, we claim the endurance given by the Holy Spirit in every part of our lives. Hear our prayer. Amen. Let's join together for the first hymn, which is Holy, Holy, Holy. You'll find it in number three, and we're going to do verses one, two, and four. Is that correct? Correct. Please stand. the peace to one another. Would you join me in the prayer of humility responsively? God of grace, we bring to you our ingratitude for all that you have done for us, our impatience when prayers seem to be ignored, our selfishness when prompted to give or share, our faithfulness when wandering from your way. We ask for your forgiveness through Jesus Christ who gave all that we may learn to do likewise. Amen. The assurance of God's grace is declared in Jesus Christ. We accept God's forgiveness, confident that in dying to sin, Christ raises us to a new life. Hear the good news. Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. 
Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creature. The old life is gone and the new life has begun. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be to, to God. God. Glory be to the Father. for the prayer of light. God of grace and mercy, show us the meaning of these scriptures that we might apply them to our lives. Allow us to listen deeply to that even small voice that we are equipped for service. We are listening, Lord. Speak to us today. And may the words in my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and redeemer. Amen. The first reading this morning is from Psalm 145, the first six verses. This is a psalm of praise attributed to David, where he acknowledges that the Lord is righteous and gracious in all his ways. This psalm sort of follows that um, requirement in the Westminster Catechism. What is the chief end of man? To glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Listen to the word from the Psalms. I will exalt you, my God and King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and exalt your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commands your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful words. They tell of the power of your awesome works. And I will proclaim your great deeds. Our second reading for this morning is taken from the Gospel Matthew. Matthew 20, verses 1 through 16. In this scripture, Jesus tells the parable of the vineyard in response to a discussion with his disciples. Listen to God's word for you today. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and he did the same thing. And about five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired me, he answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when they came, <clears throat> so when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. And when they received it, they began to grumble against the landover. Those who were hired last worked only one hour, they said. And you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered them, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. 
Don't, didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have a right to do so? And what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Well, good morning. I'm Sue Black, and I'm glad to be with you. They asked for a bio, but I have to tell you the truth. I was in a Bible study when I got that message, and by the time I sent it, I figured the secretary was long gone. <laughs> so I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about me. I'm a ruling elder from the North Liberty Presbyterian Church, um, and I have just recently finished being moderator of the Presbytery. This is my first week as past moderator because on Tuesday evening, we installed Carolyn Moss from the Slippery Rock Presbyterian Church um, as moderator and uh, ruling elder um, Mark Arnold from Trinity as vice moderator. Now, I continue on the executive team for another year, and so I get to continue to share with you the stories of other congregations and what's going on at our presbytery. And I ask you to Think about what you can do to become involved at that level because we are a relational group and so we like to enjoy. In fact, uh, City Rescue, we had a mission fair on Tuesday night and City Rescue Mission was one of the missions who were there to present to the rest of the Presbytery the good work going on down here. I also encourage you, um, thinking about it, next, this Saturday, though I didn't see it on your calendar, but Presbyterian women are going to gather here at 845 and we're going to have a program that will last till noon and then we're going to enjoy your glory grill. Um, so if you're interested, you can, you're invited to come as well. Um, our theme is Love Your Neighbor and it's based on Matthew 25. And we're going to be talking about an interact. We're going to go through an interactive program that talks about wealth, poverty, hunger, and race, and what that should be telling us, as well as doing something. Uh, Pastor Lori will be sharing the good news about what you're doing uh, here as well. As we begin our story then today, uh, I want you to understand, as they say, the backstory of today's scripture. There had been discussion and debate amongst the disciples about how and who would be honored in the kingdom of God. Jesus had told them, the first will be last and the last will be first. Something about service. But these disciples were very human, thinking that their sacrifice, leaving everything they had to come and follow him, and they at this point had been following him for two and a half years, that they wanted to know who among them would be the most honored. And when we think of the men and women of the Old and New Testament, we sort of think many of those people are going to be rewarded and honored. Well, we might make a judgment that even Peter and Paul are right up there, right? But remember, these men had their faults which is what is glorious for us. Because even though we have our faults, he's going to use us because he's shown us through the scriptures that that's what he does. So there was one of them who denied Jesus and one who persecuted Christians, and yet they were used in giving gifts, and the kingdom of God was advanced through their work. Now, I remember Ralph Hawkins, who was the um, past... Uh, EP of our presbytery, and he would say, uh, all these members of our presbytery are saints. You know, that made me feel a little bit uncomfortable, because I sort of thought of saints as very, very, very holy people, and I wasn't one of those people. But that's from the world's perspective. We're called a people, a saints, because we're gathered here from the Spirit's perspective and how wonderful that is. Later in this chapter, uh, the mother of James and John seeks to attain seats for her children on the right and left of Jesus. Now, you know, at any table, do you remember having an honored place when anybody came to visit, place where they would sit? Or was at your table, 
was your, my father always sat at the head of the table. How about? Because that was what, you know, that's what he did. So think about what she was asking. Jesus told her that he wasn't going to decide who was going to sit on the right hand and left hand side of himself. That the greatness in this kingdom is defined very differently than the world would define it by the Gentiles. So what does this parable tell us? Ken Bailey, in his teaching on the parables, tells us a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So let us review this scripture in that light. The background, we're in the fields, in a vineyard. Jesus told many of his stories based on the agriculture of the times. And in this story, is about day laborers, not the regular farm workers. These weren't regular workers, and at that time, because of the heavy tax burden of the Romans, many had lost their land. And so they would go to the marketplace and wait to be hired, hoping to be hired for a day, because then they could provide, not greatly, but could provide for their families. And they needed a common wage in order for that to happen. So the vineyard, in this, the vineyard owner, God, sends out for workers early in the morning. Now, probably that was around 6 a.m. And he agreed to pay a denarius for that day. Now, a denarius, you know, we don't know what that is, you know, thinking about it right now. Right now. Uh, don't know what the exchange rate would be in today's world. But that was a very good wage. And that was a wage given to a regular worker. And this was going to be a day worker. So you need to understand that this was generous. This was awesome that they were going to get a denarius for this day. And they agreed to that. And so that was what was common for a 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. kind of pay. So still needing workers, about 9 in the morning it says. He goes out again and still sees people standing in the marketplace and tells them to go and work in my vineyard. And I will pay you whatever is right. And so they went. And he went out again at noon and at 3 and again at 5 o'clock. And he asked them why they've been standing there all day and they say because no one's offered us work. And so he says to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. Now, I want you to think about that. When are we called to work? Is it from the beginning of our journey? Or did we not get that call or interest to serve him till we were further along? Well, when the workday ended, the group was paid in the reverse order of their hire, each receiving a denarius. So when those who came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. Why? Because they'd worked the full day. But he says to them, didn't you, didn't you agree to do that? But they grumble. Isn't that us? We grumble. And the rationale they gave for their grumbling was, I worked the full day. I did the hard work. I worked in the full sun, and you made these people who just came an hour ago equal to us. We don't think that's fair. But the owner said, I'm not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. If I want to give to the one who was hired last the same as I gave you, don't I have the right to do so? I, what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I'm generous? Now that is the rub. God's grace and reward is unfair. Jonas provides us with another example. Now how many know what happened to Jonas? Right? He got swallowed in a well. I used this as a junior sermon a couple weeks ago and the kids didn't know that, so... I'm glad you're looking around and you say you did. But do you know why Jonas got swallowed in a well? 
It was because he wanted to say, I won't. God told him, now remember, Jonas is a prophet. God told him, you go to Nineveh and you tell the people in that city that in 40 days, I'm going to destroy you unless you repent. Well, Jonas didn't like the people in Nineveh. He didn't want them to repent. And so, instead of going to Nineveh, as they say, he got out of town and went to Tarsus. But while he was heading toward Tarsus and got on that boat, the storm came up, the sailors got afraid, and he said, I know you're, I'm the reason for your problems, throw me overboard. He gets vomited out of a whale. Pretty disgusting thing. But guess what? He decides, I guess I'll go to Nineveh. <laughs> So he goes to Nineveh and it takes him three days to walk through that city and to tell them to repent. And sadly, as he was afraid would happen, they did. So what does he do? He goes outside the city and he sits down and as my husband used to say to my son, pouted with his lip out. And he pouted to a point that God took pity on him and grew a tree up and covered him from the heat. Then the plant dies because he tells him, did you have anything to do with this plant rising and dying? Why do you not want these people to receive me? And you know, we've got to think about that because he was afraid that God would show his grace and mercy to the Ninevites and not realizing that God had already shown his grace and mercy to him. Paul wrote in his letter to the Ephesians in chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. He gives us not from our work, but from his generosity. And he gives to us different talents and gifts. He gives to some the ability of music, to others hospitality, to others being able to go and visit and make people comfortable, sharing that gift of testimony. To some others, maybe it's the word, teaching, preaching, but he gives them to us unequally, but that's okay because he's decided what gifts you need for his kingdom. Paul, describing this, said to the Romans, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. In that time, and maybe even today, there are some who believed how blessed you were was in proportion to how devoted you were. And this is turning it upside down. That is not how God handled grace. The emphasis being on what you did versus what God gave. We need to see this parable through the eyes of grace. My Sunday school teacher years ago defined grace as God riches at Christ's expense. Notice who's carrying the load in that sentence. Riches, God's riches, enormous and awesome as they are, paid for by Christ, and we are the recipients of that grace. Consider this. Make a list of what God owes you. That's right nothing. If we were getting what we were deserved, we would all be damned. But because of God's grace, we receive at Christ's expense eternal life. As God said, I want to give the one who was hired the last the same as I gave you. What do we have in common? The gift of eternal life. Some of us accepted this gift in our youth. Others may at their deathbed. My former boss accepted Christ three days before he died. And his pastor was excited as could be 
at his funeral to share that fact because he knew he was given the gift of eternal life, just as the saints who had accepted him in their youth. But both were blessed, both receiving something that they didn't deserve. So are we guilty of grumbling about God's unfairness in grace? Do you think because we come to church, sing on a praise team, uh, serve on a church board, we're more worthy? And are we arguing that our reward should be greater? Or do we think that we can give, outgive God or bargain with him with his gift? Or are we like Jonah, who really didn't want to share the message with the Ninevites because he was afraid God would forgive them and not destroy these people he didn't like. So now make a list of everything you owe God. From a point of gratitude, we need to be working on this list. Have you ever noticed when we ask for blessings, we can't come up with a few, you know, those what I call the Sunday school answers, um, family, friends, house, health, job, you know, we really haven't thought about how great and awesome and wonderful the gifts are that we've been blessed with. We need to ponder our list so that we can contribute to God the awesomeness way he loved us first. I live in Grove City. Coming down here today, you know, the trees, this is my favorite time of year in a sense because you know, every time you go around the bend, you see something different than you saw two days before because the colors have changed. How awesome is that creation? How wonderful is that love? So instead of grumbling, we need to commit to celebrating the grace of God, realizing it's not based on our work or our trying to earn brownie points, but we are blessed so we are equipped to serve others and to accomplish the work of the kingdom. We're laboring because we're grateful for the gifts we have received. And hopefully we want others to receive it. And because of that, we share that love. We need to look within ourselves to determine what our motives are. God's amazing grace was given to me at Christ's expense. What more can I say but praise the Lord? Amen. Thank you, Susan. Very inspirational and heartfelt message. Thank you so much. If we could stand, please, and sing a beautiful song that follows up with that message, which is Amazing Grace. This is an insert, and the lyrics will be up on the screen.
Now in today's world, I have to ask, how do you do your dedication of gifts? Do you leave them back there? Do you bring them forward? with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the gifts that we've been given, the awesome gift of eternal life, the spirit that you put within us at our baptism. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to bring back to you our tithes and our offerings and even ourselves. Bless each gift that was given. May it expand to do what you would want it to do within your kingdom. And Use it to show your majesty and love to the world around us. For we pray in your precious name, amen. Let us also continue in prayer as we lift up the concerns of your hearts. Are there anything special that we need to be praying for today? Well, I'd ask you to think about Lori as she is getting some reprieve and regenerated in, in a beautiful part of the country as she travels this week. Uh, we have some folks who will have some health issues and you'll see them in your bulletin, our homebound persons. We need to think about the situation in Israel and the Palestinians. And I would raise up uh, the school district of Lakeview. They lost three students in a fiery accident on uh, Thursday, and they are really suffering right now. It's a small district in Mercer County. Think about our country and think about the world situation. Um, we had at the Presbyterian meeting a uh, word about Sudan, and I represent the Dominican Republic. We've set our mission trip for April, I mean for February for next year and uh, we're looking for people so if you are interested in uh, being a construction worker or have a health background and you need feel called uh, speak to me but we have needs in our world don't we so let's go to God in prayer dear Heavenly Father we come together as your people in this place thankful for what you have given to us in so many ways thankful that you've called us to be a servant people, to respond to the needs and the passions within us. We pray for the, civic, uh, the City Rescue Mission as they do virtual tour this week. We pray for their open house coming. We pray for the work of our presbytery, the work of our churches, the churches worldwide as they respond to tragedy and famine and hunger and need. Help us to use each dollar to the best of its ability to be used so that your work can be completed. We ask you, Lord, to be with Pastor Lori as she uh, has a vacation this week. Be with her and have her regenerated when she returns. We pray for those who are in health issues and need your care. May the medical team servicing them be guided by your wisdom and discernment, and may your will be done in those situations. We pray for those who grieve. Help us to be a people of hope, knowing that we've been given a precious, precious gift that we share with those called before and for those in the future who will come after us. We pray for victims of tragedy and violence. We pray for Israel and for the Palestinians. We think about the terrible violence and conflict that occur in that area where you walked when you were here on earth. And we ask for your guidance as they try to remedy that issue. We pray for our country, the confusion and conflict 
We've lost civility, Lord, and we ask you to help us through your word and through your ability to guide people to be more civil with each other and show love rather than hate, love rather than violence. And may we be part of that gift of giving that shows love. Lord, whatever we do and say throughout this week as you prepare us for service, open our eyes to see what we see around us. Help us to meet needs, to pray for the needs we see, and to be guided by your love and spirit. And Lord, as we do this, we ask you to help us pray the prayer you gave your disciples so long ago and you give to us today. Our Father, Father who Lord art in heaven, heaven Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. If we stand, please. Our sending forth song of hope is they'll know we are Christians. That's the name of the song. God's grace can be defined as God's riches at Christ's expense. We acknowledge that we sometimes grumble and criticize God's free gift given to others, but accepting it for ourselves. Help us to appreciate that gift and the awesome and amazing love that touches all of God's children, and may we celebrate the grace we also freely receive. Amen. Amen. God be with you.